In an ever-growing trend of soulless re-releases, sloppy remasters, and very safe remakes, Resident Evil 2 bucks that trend by blurring the once definite line between remake and reimagining. A large chunk of the source material returns, but with some tweaks and even major changes to the structure built on top of the foundation you've come to expect. Most of the changes present in this title indicate a very strong desire to bridge the best parts of the first trilogy with the best parts of the second trilogy. For a very long time, bridging this gap seemed to be impossible. Until the release of Resident Evil 7, the idea of Capcom even returning back to old school horror seemed like wishful thinking. But from my experience, I'm happy to say that Resident Evil 2 not only continues continues the excellent return to form established by Resident Evil 7, but surpasses it. Obviously with such a drastically different design philosophy from the other Resident Evil titles, I'm sure some people will be left disappointed by some of the changes. But even with that being said, this is where I stand when it comes to this title. Resident Evil 2 is one of the best Resident Evil games ever made, hands down. Does this mean it's the best remake of this franchise? Absolutely not. That title still belongs to the remake of the first game. But the real reason that I'm saying this is because Resident Evil 2 is not a remake. Not in the traditional sense at least. If we're being honest, Resident Evil 1 Remake is the only real remake that actually tries to be the definitive way to experience the game as it was truly intended, acting as a form of a director's cut that fixes almost everything that went wrong the first time, whereas the other remakes are more like a book to a movie adaptation that takes some liberties and creative freedom, but a good chunk gets lost in translation. I will still call it Resident Evil 2 Remake from time to time for the sake of simplicity, but Resident Evil 2 is more of a reimagining than anything else. Ever since its release, Resident Evil 2 has challenged me to question the idea of remakes and reimaginings being two entirely different things with a clear line dividing the two. But nowadays, I look at remakes and reimaginings as two different ends of the same spectrum, meaning that a game can actually be a bit of both at the same time, but also allows you to definitely put a final verdict on which side it truly belongs by the end of your playthrough. Or in my case, a dozen playthroughs at least. I've probably finished the game that many times back when it came out to obtain the Platinum Trophy, but I did go back and play it another couple of times just recently to reassess my thoughts and initial impressions, and also to record footage for this review. So, how exactly does Resident Evil 2 hold up as of today? Well, let's find out, shall we? Now's a good time to grab a beverage or a snack and buckle up, boys. We're headed to Raccoon City. I hope you enjoy my review of the new and modern Resident Evil 2 The Ultimate Reimagining Let's start with the premise. Story-wise, Resident Evil 2 is basically the 1998 version all over again. It picks up a few months after the horrific mansion incident from the first game. The few Stars members who were lucky enough to make it out alive lived to tell the tale. That tale fell on very deaf ears though, and the city went to hell after that. Enter Leon Kennedy, a rookie cop who was told by the RPD themselves not to come for his first day at work in Raccoon City. This part's actually funny. In the original, the dude just didn't show up because of a hangover. Then he went late to work and everyone was already dead, so it practically saved his life. For the reimagining that he retconned this part of the story into making Leon being suspicious about the call and going to Raccoon City anyway. This is just my opinion, but I prefer the original's explanation much better. I don't like it when it's always the goody good naive cop who just shows up to work because justice. Could you please just leave that trope alone? We already have Judge Dredd and Batman for that. And buddy cop movies. And procedural crime dramas. Would it kill you guys to be original for once? Anyway, so he stops at a gas station just outside of the city, but senses something wrong with the place and heads inside the pitch black store to investigate. He does find an injured person, presumably the shopkeeper, bleeding from the neck and pointing at the door behind him. This part right here masterfully sets the tone for what's about to come. A dimly lit hallway with a flickering light, a distressful sound grows louder and louder as we approach the door, and then we get this. Stop moving. Officer, you need help? Uh, stay back, sir. I got this. Uh, uh, hey! Uh, wait uh, down! Uh, 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 I 
I'm aware that this is just fan service, but this is one of the most beautiful homages I've ever seen in a video game. A callback to the first zombie in Resident Evil 1. The first zombie in Resident Evil 1 was creepy and a bit obscured and shrouded in mystery. The first zombie in Resident Evil 2 though, feels like a perfect evolution of that. It's a bit faster paced, it's just as moody and dark, but now the details are all laid bare for you to see in all of this game's graphical glory. The hyper realism and the gore of this game just blew me away the first time I saw this. I've never seen skin looking so lifelike up to this point, if you'll excuse the pun. As someone who's been a fan of this series since the classic RE3 game, this was the milestone in graphics evolution that I was waiting for. This scene really does make me wonder what the original first zombie would look like if Resident Evil 1 was made today. You're now faced with two options, fight the zombie or escape from the shop. Just as you're about to leave, you bump into a biker jacket wearing lady and you shoot the zombie behind her. Then you both make your way to the car and head straight into the city. During this downtime, Leon and this woman become acquaintances. Her name is Claire Redfield, a student looking for her older brother, Chris Redfield. That's right, the one and only. Claire is the second protagonist of this game. If you play as Claire, the opening scene plays exactly the same, but the roles get reversed. Claire stops first at the gas station, investigates the shop, encounters the first zombie, then bumps into Leon by the front door. However, the part where Claire gets down and Leon shoots the zombie behind her is still the same, but Leon is outside this time and Claire is inside. This scene was also in the original and while it's not exactly the same, it's in a gas station instead of a diner, I am so glad that the essence of this opening scene was preserved and beautifully recreated for modern audiences. When it comes to this opening, I think the biggest difference by far is the distance from the car to the police station, as it's much shorter this time. In the remake, you can practically trip over a dead body on the street and you fall face flat right in front of the station. It's that short. Is that a bad thing though? Yes and no. It throws you straight into the best section of the game, that being the police station, but unfortunately the changes to how you make it to your destination makes the streets of Raccoon City underwhelming this time. And if you love the streets of Raccoon City in the original Resident Evil 2, you're more than likely disappointed about this. Luckily the fun part is still about to begin. Depending on who you've picked, Leon or Claire, make it to the station. Just like the Spencer Mansion, no one seems to be around. But as you'll soon come to realize with these Resident Evil buildings, nothing is ever as it seems. From here on out, the name of the game is the same as before. You solve puzzles, kill, stagger or avoid enemies standing in your way, try to piece together what's really going on and then get the hell out. Okay, so moving on to gameplay, let's start with the big elephant in the room. Resident Evil 2's biggest gameplay change is the switch from fixed camera angles to an over the shoulder that is aesthetically very reminiscent of Resident Evil 4. I can absolutely see why Capcom went with this style given that the over the shoulder silhouette of the dude with perfect hair and a handgun is synonymous with Leon Kennedy. The same way a backpack and dual pistols are synonymous with Lara Croft. However, the game that has been designed around this perspective is far more similar to Resident Evil 7 and the slow burn creepy labyrinthian level design of the classic games rather than the intense edge of your seat adrenaline inducing panic attacking combat arenas of Resident Evil 4. The name of the game here isn't run and gun before you lose your head, it's more of a spray and pray you don't lose your sanity, solving puzzles and getting lost, as the big Mr. X relentlessly wanders around the halls and corridors of this station, who would like nothing more than to insert your head into a wall and make a hole so big you'd think he's trying to give you another medallion puzzle to solve. The puzzles are plentiful in this one, there's enough depth and variety to make running around the station extremely fun to explore, but nothing too difficult to stop you in your tracks and ruin the pacing. After a certain trigger event in the campaign, Mr. X, the tall, menacing looking trench coat wearing tyrant, starts to haunt you with his monumental footsteps because you decided to shoot his pretty little hat off and now he wants you to buy him another one. Jesus Christ! Much like the nemesis tyrant and Jack Baker, Mr. X is this game's stalker enemy, a pursuer. His role from the original is a significant improvement, with his ever looming presence being one of the game's strongest horror elements, raising the stakes and forcing you to make even more strategic planning before you leave the sacred confines of the sanctuary that is the safe room. Now I get that some people absolutely do not like being stressed under time and pressure to explore their surroundings, but rest assured with the right tactics and a good understanding standing of the map, not only can you delay this part, but you can also make this a non-issue. I don't know why some particular reviews hammered this concern home, because there is a difficulty setting for people who don't like to be stressed. 
It's called assisted mode. If you choose this mode, Mr. X walks at a snail's pace. The game is also designed in a way to give you breathing room from Mr. X from time to time anyway. He cannot enter save rooms. And some crucial puzzle rooms are off limits too for the big boy with the missing hat. If you're someone who doesn't like stress, you're gonna be fine. Now back to the stressful stuff. Adding to the overall stress level is the increased amount of dark areas. Most of these areas make a return from the original, but now they're no longer well lit and instead you traverse these areas using a flashlight. Some would argue that these redesigned areas should be well lit to be fully appreciated, but I actually like the change. I find the darkness adds a lot more to the atmosphere and tension. Watching silhouettes of the undead limp around in the dark and damp corridors is one of my favorite parts of this game. I mean, hey, I grew up with the classic Silent Hill games. I have fond memories of the darkness and flashlight exploration. Silent Hill has been a dead horse for almost a decade now. I mean, there are some rumors about it coming back, but whatever. I'll take what I can get. And it's not just reminiscent of the Silent Hill games. One of the prototypes for Resident Evil 4 called the Hookman version was supposed to have Leon Kennedy with a flashlight. Ultimately, it did not work out for Resident Evil 4, but for Resident Evil 2, I'm glad that they went back to this concept and made something tangible out of it. It's a phenomenal inclusion to this game. Speaking of phenomenal inclusions, defensive items. Defensive items are one of my favorite survival mechanics in all of Resident Evil. They finally make a comeback from Resident Evil 1 Remake, and they work just as well in Resident Evil 2. It's such a simple little addition that really changes and amplifies the survival horror experience. What's cool about the defensive items is how they differ from the first remake. This time they do take up space in the inventory and they are multifunctional. For example, in Resident Evil 1 Remake you could only use a grenade if an enemy grabs you. In Resident Evil 2, you are free to throw that grenade at an enemy to stun or kill them. Or you can decide to keep them in your inventory so that when you're in danger, you'll have a get out of jail free card. Adding to that survival horror gameplay is the return of typewriters and item boxes. The item boxes in this game particularly work almost flawlessly. They're very well spaced apart, not too far, not too close. I like the item boxes in the older games, but I found them more tedious than challenging. In this one, they feel like they have just the right amount of balance of thinking three steps ahead with your inventory management and the tediousness that comes from forgetting a puzzle item when you need to progress. I never felt like the backtracking in this game was getting on my nerves, and that's due to the other factors besides the way the item box has been handled. The map and the inventory screen are just as intuitive, with the map highlighting every item you come across but didn't pick up, and also uses color coding to tell you if you picked up everything from a specific room. The inventory screen is a godsend in this one. If you're like me, you're always forgetting what you have on you, and then obsessively opening the inventory over and over like it's 2am in the morning and you're hoping that a bar of Kit Kat magically appears in your fridge the 25th time you open that damn thing. The last thing you'd need is for the inventory screen to have an input delay every time you bring it up. But worry not, Resident Evil 2 has that problem covered. Ever since the soft rebooted approach of Resident Evil 7 and onwards, this issue has been fixed. The inventory screen has never been more functional, accessible, snappy, and intuitive. Last but not least, I want to go over how the combat works in this title. So you have a lot of effort put into the game to make it feel like a dreadful but immersive maze akin to the classic Resident Evil titles, but with the camera angle and combat mechanics of Resident Evil 4 and 5, where a puzzle would half the time boil down to, if you can't open it, shoot it, and if you can, shoot it anyway. Two different design philosophies, one game. So how do you bridge the two ideas? And in 2019, you expect to move and shoot at the same time, so... How do you go back to the drawing board and redo the way it works without turning it into another Resident Evil 6? Well, I have two words for you. Reticle focus. The way the reticle works in Resident Evil 2 is one of the most ingenious little tweaks in Resident Evil history. It's not a groundbreaking reinvention of the wheel for the gaming industry like the over-the-shoulder camera was, but it solved one of the biggest combat dilemmas of this franchise with such simplicity and elegance that I think it would be unfair not to highlight how massive of an achievement it truly is. Though, to put things into perspective, the reticle focus is just one of two parts as to what makes the combat satisfying. The other half of the equation is bullet damage. For the large majority of the game, the most encountered enemies are zombies, which means that for the game's combat to work, at least for me, you need to make the zombie encounters interesting to engage with. When it comes to satisfying combat in Resident Evil games, I think it boils down to two things. Number one, an addicting gameplay loop. Number two, great feedback.
Maybe it's just me, but I feel like a lot of people don't talk about feedback in their reviews. Feedback is one of the most crucial elements to a video game to being enjoyable. I've compiled a list of criteria to be met for a Resident Evil game's combat to be satisfying. Number 1. Visible bullet damage. Number 2. Enemies react and stagger with both visual and audible cues. Number 3. Gun sound effects pack a serious punch. Number 4. Gore and blood sound effects. Number 5. A variety of ways to deal with enemy encounters. For the most part, the combat feedback in Resident Evil 2 ticks all of these boxes. The bullet damage is on another level, even for a Resident Evil game. It's still the best bullet damage system to date, even when compared to other follow-up titles like Resident Evil 3 and Village. The impact of the bullets feel incredible with each shot. Something I want to point out real quick, a lot of mainstream reviewers complained about zombies being bullet sponges. The problem with this complaint is that it does not fit the criteria for what a bullet sponge truly is. Bullet sponges are enemies or bosses that have an absurdly large amount of health for no reason other than to create a cheap difficulty spike instead of an actual challenge that forces you to engage with these enemies with better tactics. On top of that, bullet sponges offer little to no feedback whatsoever, which exacerbates how cheap and lazy an enemy's design can feel. A prime example would be The Division. That one in particular is notorious for bullet sponges being considered a bad design due to the enemies being normal human beings, which means that another problem that arises with bullet sponges is the lack of immersion that comes with the territory. Resident Evil 2 zombies have none of these problems. They do take an awful lot of bullets to the face, but the game counteracts this problem by providing as much feedback to each shot as possible. The number of headshots required for a zombie to go down permanently is randomized. Sometimes you can even get lucky and put them down with an instant head explosion. And even other times if you're unlucky enough that you need to unload a whole magazine between the eyes, every single headshot feels like it does something to eat away at their bone structure through the sound of their skull cracking and breaking piece by piece with bits of skin and brains eroding. Even if some of the guns sound as powerful as a wet fart, you still get the sensation that they're puncturing something in that empty brain craving brain of theirs. This feedback is just as equal impressive on other limbs, whether you slice an arm off with a trusty knife and suddenly you see the appendage slowly melt away from the elbow, or even shooting them in the kneecap and you see it popping right off and making them crawl for the rest of eternity. Another thing to keep in mind here is the reticle focus. The narrower it gets, the higher the damage output. I'm not sure whether the reticle amplifies the actual damage output or the chances of a critical headshot, or both, but regardless of what it is, it affects the outcome for sure. If you're not paying attention to the reticle focus, you're not gonna have a good time time, and it's no wonder you feel like they are bullet sponges. Incorrectly classifying the zombies in Resident Evil 2 as bullet sponges says more about the reviewers than the game itself. The reticle focus exists for a reason. It's Resident Evil 2's way of pushing you into its gameplay mechanics. The same way Doom Eternal pushes you into its gameplay systems by dodging and having limited ammo capacity and needing to switch weapons all the time. You want a Resident Evil game that actually has bullet sponges? Try Resident Evil 3 or Village on the hardest difficulties. And that wraps up the gameplay. That's all I have to say about it. I just love how it plays. The mechanics are well balanced, the controls feel super optimized and responsive as hell, the shooting and bullet damage is incredibly satisfying, it feels challenging in a good way, the enemies while limited in variety have a quality over quantity feel to their design, and to top it all off, this game is designed with multiple, multiple playthroughs in mind. You're gonna have a good time playing this for a very long time. Also for a very long time, if you sit down with a pair of headphones over your head and take your sweet ass time admiring the architecture and both the chaos and silence bestowed upon it, you might just end up like the unfortunate dude who got lickety lick by the liquor in the west hallway, and rumor has it, he's still trying to find his jaw on the floor. This is Immersion 101. It's as if in 2019, RE2's visuals pulled me in like a super massive black hole and given that it's been two years and it still has me so starstruck, I'm now either in an alternate dimension where I never dissolved into the abyss, or I got so fubar on the other end that I now have the metabolism of a Jack Russell and a Fox Terrier mix that it only feels like two years but it's actually been five minutes. Since this game came out, we've had both Resident Evil 3 and Village elevating the graphical chops even further, but for some oddball reason, Resident Evil 2 is still the game that leaves me most in awe every time I boot it up. There's a certain cohesion to how everything looks and sounds that allows it to sell the fiction with more conviction than both its predecessors and follow-ups. When you start the game, the first thing you see is a half-eaten hamburger that looks so convincingly real, I cannot tell whether I want to recoil in disgust or order one just like it, because I'm now hungrier than a bodybuilder craving a cheat meal. 60 frames per second never looked tastier. Wait, did you say 60 frames per second? Actually yes, 
While the footage I have from a PS4 Pro is in 30 FPS, sorry about that, it actually runs at a mostly rock solid 60 FPS, and it really does help with how cinematic and polished the experience feels. How do I know it's cinematic? Well, when I'm fully immersed into a video game's world design, I'm usually walking in every room and meticulously panning the camera around like I'm about to drop the greatest E3 demo gameplay that's ever been made and ends up disappointing everyone when it's finally out. At this point, I'm so jaded by a lot of games looking and feeling the same that it's actually refreshing to see myself actually wanting to take my time and take it all in. The redesigned RPD station is my favorite Metroidvania location in the series. It's got everything I enjoyed about the Spencer Mansion from the RE1 remake and then some. The new design perfectly strikes a balance between the wackiness of the puzzle design and the realism of the setting. The main hall is now vibrant, colored with clutter and furniture, warm lights, and objects of all sorts thrown about to create a sense of environmental storytelling. There's a sense of history as if something terrible happened here before you arrived. The quiet ambiance contradicting such depictions of harm and tragedy boggles the mind, which makes the environmental storytelling even more disturbing the more you contemplate. This fascinating emphasis on the environment telling a story in the background happens several times and I want to discuss those instances for a bit. The East Hallway is a great example. This section used to be well lit and infested with the undead. Now it's shrouded in darkness, mysterious as all hell and, to nobody's surprise, still filled to the brim with the undead. Water's leaking everywhere, there's flickering lights, pools of blood, but no enemies in sight. Almost as if they're hiding somewhere. But where? The plot thickens. Actually, you'll find out when you reach the end of the hallway. Easily. Easily. The creepiest place in the station. Also one of my favorites. It's dreadful, but I just... It's so well done. The fear of the unknown in this place just fills that Silent Hill void, even if just a little bit. The west hallway feels just as sinister, but switches up the dark and obscure with something a bit more visual and graphic and much less subtle. I don't know if anyone who played or reviewed this game stumbled upon this idea, but as I'm writing this review it's almost as if the game is trying to have a commentary on the differences between American and Japanese horror techniques. The tropes associated with both schools of thought even happen to be in the right place. East and West. I don't know if it's just a coincidence, maybe I'm reading too deep into this? I'm from neither one of these places and I think that from this detached point of view it just seemed like a cool little easter egg. The west side gets even creepier when the liquors start wandering around and seeing them crawl on the walls and ceilings after you notice just how much destruction and chaos there's been in here, it really does fill in the blanks as to what the hell happened. I gotta hand it to this game, the R&D Division 1 studio responsible for this gem, they absolutely understand the importance of build-up. Building up tension is like watching a Bob Ross painting. Relaxing, nice, gentle, slow, happy clouds, sunshine and rainbows. Until it fucking isn't. Character models in Resident Evil 2 are a massive step forward. Resident Evil 7's faces and facial animations, while extremely impressive thanks to the RE engine and photogrammetry tech, still fell a little bit short because of the little things like hair looking a bit lifeless and teeth looking way too straight and perfect if you ask me. Not that there is anything wrong with that, but I don't know, when I see a family that looks straight out of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, having teeth like a Hollywood celebrity is not the first thing that springs to mind. I don't have that same problem with this game, except for maybe one character. But let's talk about the main cast first. Let's start with Leon. This guy's appearance is so unique in the video game space, when they were designing him for Resident Evil 4, Shinji Mikami probably sat down with the artists over by the alchemy table in a chemistry set and started sprinkling magical dust, requesting it to be a, a hint of Jensen Ackles, a dash of DiCaprio and a touch of I'm here to chew bubblegum and kick ass and I'm all out of bubblegum. But instead of a touch, one of the artists probably went full Bob Ross by dropping the whole jar and as a result created the world's happiest accident. Resident Evil 2 faithfully recreates the look and feel of the character to a T, but now adds a hint of a 90s boy band aesthetic that feels appropriate for the game's time period and setting. Claire Redfield's character model deserves just as much praise. Every game from here on in should stick to this look. I think it's perfect. The mesmerizing blue eyes, the black hair, the made in heaven jacket. The original outfit is missing. You can unlock an outfit that is kind of an homage, but it's not what most fans were expecting. It doesn't bother me at all, but I can see why diehard fans of the original were 
were not happy with it. I think the new design, while looking a bit more ordinary, does work a lot better. She looks less gamey and more of a normal person trying to find a way out, which is exactly what the original game was going for anyway. Besides, I like the Elsa Walker outfit more than every other outfit combined, so it's a trade I'm okay with. I'm not saying that to invalidate other people's complaints, I think it's a very, very valid complaint, but when it comes to me specifically, I had absolutely no problem. In fact, I think I made it pretty clear that this version of Claire is my favorite one. Basically everybody looks good. I also think Sherry and Ada look phenomenal. The Birkins look the way you'd expect them to, and Mr. X looks emotionless yet intimidating, and all of the enemies look incredible. Every last one. The zombies more than anything else because of the impeccable gore and bullet damage system. Most of the other enemies don't have the same system in place due to only taking damage in specific weak spots, but even they make up for it with interesting and hyper detailed designs and you can view their character models in the main menu, which is awesome. Remember that one character I mentioned who I thought doesn't look that great? Yeah, it's this waste of oxygen of a character, Chief Irons. I don't know what's up with this dude, he looks like a giant toad that's eaten way too many hamburgers and now lives in despair. Maybe they couldn't find someone who looks this evil in real life. I don't know, he looks like he needs a hug in the face with the sweet embrace of a crowbar. I think that is enough about how these characters look, so let's move on to voice acting. This is good news. We can get you to hospital. No, no, I am not the priority here. Lieutenant, I'm not just gonna leave you here. I'm giving you an order, rookie! You save yourself first. I think your daughter needs help, sir. Don't tell me how to deal with my daughter. Drop it. What's the matter? We'll fix that. Go, oh, yes, we will. Let me go! Let me go! You're supposed to know something. How did this happen? Oh, no! We never meant for this to happen. Just go. Just give us some privacy. As always with the Resi games, the actors have a daunting task to read some real piece of work cringe and cheesy infested game scripts that somehow seem to get progressively worse instead of better, and then actually making those cheesy lines somehow sound endearing instead of embarrassing. By some miracle the franchise has found a way to improve the voice acting while simultaneously downgrading the writing with every iteration, and in Resident Evil 2 it's no different. The voice acting is quite well done here. I wish to highlight the fact that the new actors for Leon and Claire had large shoes to fill, and I for one think they absolutely knocked it out of the park. Nick Apostolidis does an excellent interpretation of Leon as a determined rookie, and you can tell that there was a lot of care put into respecting the source material while also putting his own spin on things and leaving a mark of his own. Stephanie Panizello also gives a tremendous performance as Claire, and while I feel she does take a little bit more liberty with introducing certain elements of feistiness and ferocity that I feel wasn't as present before, I still think it was an adjustment that paid off big time. This is the most I've ever felt invested in Claire's character by a landslide. Some of the voice acting also bleeds into the gameplay with both protagonists expressing their WTF moments when some undead schmuck takes six bullets to the head like an absolute champ. I'm also flabbergasted by some of the side characters, most notably Marvin Brana, voiced by Christopher Michael Watson. This guy, in my opinion, gave the best performance of the entire game. I'm not even kidding. This is some of the greatest voice work I've seen in this series, and deserves a lot more praise. Same with Robert Kendo. His appearance is criminally short, but steals the entire show. There's not one performance I didn't like in this game. Great casting, and while some of the writing does hinder the potential for more weight in certain moments, the overall effort is still impeccable. <laughs> Even the zombies sound great. Now granted, I personally am not a fan of how every zombie sounds like it's from The Walking Dead. I find the slow, agonizing moans a lot more unsettling. However, I think that it actually works here, and when they close that gap, shit gets real. Have you ever noticed how quiet this game is? Maybe even too quiet. Better get used to that. RE2 2019 ditches the banger of a soundtrack from the original and instead chose an overly minimalistic approach to its music. I think that with the bigger emphasis on ambient noise going on in the reimagining, it makes a little bit of sense to have some musical reductions for the sake of better immersion, but I think that they took it a bit too far. 
The old soundtrack is available behind a paywall anyway, so the game is clearly designed to work with music in some capacity. And I think it's a shame that a game that wouldn't exist without such a huge demand for a remake in the first place lets its fans down by not offering an option to have the old music included free of charge, or an equally impressive tracklist as an alternative. But if you're a newcomer to the franchise, I really doubt that it's going to matter, so there's that. Around the third act, the music actually picks up a bit. The last two boss fights in particular are amazing, and to my surprise, the unlockable side mission known as the fourth survivor contains probably the best music track of the whole game. I'd like to end this section on a positive note by saying that while the music doesn't live up to the high expectations set by itself from 1998, it does improve the overall sound design and the way it's utilized to create an immersive world. It is a very different kind of enchantment. The original was all about how it can use music to reflect on the mood that's supposed to be conveyed at any given time, whereas the reimagining is obsessed with making you take note of every wooden creak, the raindrops splashing on the windows outside, the disturbances occurring on the other side of the building, or the way your character shifts their own body weight from one calculated footstep to the next. Speaking of footsteps, the binaural sound system for Mr. X is what really sells the dread, capable of both helping the player identify how close or far he might be. It's even good at telling the player if he's on a floor above or below you, and also scaring the living daylights out of you when you underestimate his traversal and teleporting skills, and then you get greeted with a surprise concussion that transports you into the next week. In the meantime, music seems to be a last resort, held for moments that require the game to sacrifice immersion for a sense of urgency in relation to the story. Regardless of some of the letdowns, the overall package of graphics, sound design, and the redonkulous levels of immersion they've managed to create for this world, it's staggeringly impressive. Resident Evil has always been chock full of replay value. RE2 Remake has this as well. But with a few caveats, the B scenarios make a return from the original. Back then they offered some big changes to the outcome of the story, allowing you to form a better idea of how things actually went down. There used to be something called a zapping system as well, where gameplay decisions made by one protagonist impacted the other in significant ways. The reimagined B scenarios offer none of that. This time around, the two biggest changes at play are your starting location and the ability to witness the true ending. Some of the puzzles and items do get switched around and Mr. X spawns much earlier this time, so the stakes are somewhat higher. There are weapons that are exclusive to the B scenario. Leon finds an M19 handgun and Claire obtains a quick draw army revolver. When it comes to fleshing out the story though, the B scenarios are an absolute half-assery. The A scenarios were already polluted with plot holes and inconsistencies, the most notorious one being how Annette magically appears in both Leon and Claire's campaigns and her demise plays out almost exactly the same in both. And that's just the one that keeps getting highlighted. But you'll have a lot of identical encounters throughout the game's runtime and somehow the two protagonists never stumble upon one another. Except for maybe once. This game does the exact same mistake as the Resident Evil remake, where the character you don't choose ends up exiting the game all the way until the end. Until the game then remembers that it needs to show you that both of them survive, so it just conveniently makes them show up at the end. If the original game from 21 years prior can come up with a more cohesive storyline than this, at that point it's just lazy writing. This is exactly why the story loses any significance after a couple of playthroughs. You start to notice how rushed and poorly thought out the story truly feels, which can take you out of the experience. I'm not asking for a deeply thought-provoking story like Red Dead Redemption 2 here. This is Resident Evil after all, but just because the story has always been hit or miss doesn't excuse it from criticism. This isn't some arena a shooter like Doom where the story means absolutely fuck all and is just an excuse for crazy shit to go down. This is a franchise that is heavily reliant on cutscenes and story. Just because the first game accidentally became a comedy due to its terrible dialogue doesn't mean that it's okay for every other game after that to have the same problem. This isn't the franchise being meta and self-aware of its own writing cliches. That only happened once and it was Resident Evil 4. Every other game ever since is just so poorly written that it tries to pretend that it knows what it's doing by convoluting things for no reason and introducing needless lore to distract from the simple reality that the writers just don't know what to do with any of it. They're just winging it. Don't expect to be blown away by the B scenarios here. It's just a shorter run with a couple of changes and an extra boss fight, and it solves none of the plot holes. It's practically the Resident Evil 1 formula of what-if scenarios for both characters, but with none of the plethora of alternative endings to back up the idea of things only happening in one instance and not the other. What a wasted opportunity.
Aside from the B scenarios, you have other alternatives, such as hardcore difficulty. If you are a veteran of the series or you're looking to get the most out of your game, this is the way Resident Evil 2 is meant to be experienced. Restricted ammo and health pickups, enemies hit harder and take more bullets to kill. You also need to save with ink ribbons instead of relying on checkpoints. It does seem daunting at first, but trust me when I say this, mastering this difficulty can be so wholesome and satisfying. And unlike the follow-up titles, this is not some bullcrap difficulty setting where the only way to beat the game is to buy some machine gun with infinite ammo from the main menu that requires hours of pointless loot grinding and arbitrary challenges. All you need on hardcore mode in RE2 is to simply use your head. Constantly planning routes ahead of time and making sure you get your dodging tactics and item management on point and save your healing items at all costs. You're gonna need them. And if you want to take things a step further, you can always push yourself to the limit by going for speed runs with S and S plus rankings, which can unlock some seriously overpowered weapons with infinite ammo. Now that's how you do unlockables. There is also the fourth survivor mode I mentioned a while ago, a little mini game where you play as everybody's favorite Grim Reaper, Agent Hunk. The task is simple, you start at the bottom of the sewers, head up to the station and make it to the front gate. Sounds easy, right? <laughs> right? Right, guys? Anyone? This minigame will use everything you've learned in the campaign against you, forcing you to use all of your knowledge and reflexes. Certain pathways are locked off or barricaded, enemies travel in larger packs, sometimes even different types of enemies get clumped together to make your life a living hell. Which also means that if you want to make it to the rendezvous point, you will need to memorize the layout of the maps to the best of your capabilities. There's also an even harder variation of this minigame called Tofu Mode. You'll literally play as a giant block of tofu with nothing but a bunch of knives to defend yourself. Yeah, this is not my cup of tea. And last but not least, the last side activity I'd like to mention is the Free Ghost Survivors DLC. These are non-canonical escape scenarios for some of the NPCs that never made it out of the city. There's four characters to pick from, but you only start with three. There's Kendo, Mayor Warren's daughter, a soldier who looks just like Hunk but is called Ghost, and the last character is the sheriff from the start of the game. As you can see, I have no footage playing as the sheriff, which should tell you everything about what I think about this mode. It's cool and all, but it just feels like another fourth survivor clone with different skins, and after a while it gets old. It's not the mercenaries mode everybody wanted, but oh well, at least it's there if you want to try it, I guess. And now, time to wrap it up. Resident Evil 2 2019 is far from what I call a remake, and if you do consider it as such, it's a cherry-picked one at best, taking extreme liberties with a lot of things, but also playing it very safe with others. Some changes are controversial, and some changes are for the better. There will never be a remake like the GameCube version of Resident Evil 1. But I think that after seeing Resident Evil 3 also getting a modernized take, I think we'll never get a reimagining like Resident Evil 2 either. It's not the scariest game in the series, or even the most creative one at that, but it's the most competent amalgamation of everything, everything that worked well for the franchise. The intricate level design of Resident Evil Remake, the ammo crafting and pursuer type enemy from Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, the cleaner, more streamlined layout and controls from Resident Evil 7, all of that somehow beautifully mixed with the over-the-shoulder camera style, gameplay feedback and tension of Resident Evil 4, and adding an insane graphical fidelity to boot. I don't know how the hell they pulled it off so well, but pull it off they most certainly have. There's been many, many Resident Evil games over the years. There's 12 of them just on the PS4 alone, and that's barely even half of them. But somehow, Resident Evil 2, with all of its flaws and controversies, manages to surpass almost all of them for me, creating one of the most satisfying and immersive gaming experiences that I've ever had in my life. This was my game of the year for 2019, and even though I haven't gotten around to finishing Sekiro yet or even Devil May Cry 5, I have no doubt that this game will never get dethroned from being my favorite game from that year. It's that good. It's in my top 3 Resident Evil games of all time, and it's the perfect culmination of everything that made Resident Evil the juggernaut of a series that it is today. And that is exactly why I believe Resident Evil 2 is the ultimate reimagining and one of the best Resident Evil games of all time. And with that, the Raven draws to a conclusion. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.